Greetings, Starfighters, and, um... <clears throat> One moment. <clears throat> Greetings, Starfighters, and welcome to the first 2018 episode of Shameless Cash Grab. Still on the Strange Things set. Just a couple movies left to go in that. But the good news is I have already ordered and received the DVD set for the next season. What is the next season going to be? Not telling you yet. But for today's show, we will be talking about 1981's Alien Contamination, starring Ian McCulloch, Louise Marlowe, and Marino Mace. Now, I said in a previous, at the end of the previous episode, that Alien Contamination was certainly a ripoff of the Xenomorph movies, but I but it was going to be a toss-up whether it was a rip-off of the first one, the Ridley Scott one, or Aliens, the James Cameron one. I should not have made that assumption, because 1981, Aliens hadn't come out yet, so this is definitely going to be a rip-off of Alien. However, I think, no matter how it turns out, it's probably going to be better than Prometheus. All right, and I have now watched 1981s, or 1980s, depending on what website you're looking at, uh, Alien Contamination. But before I go into it, and before I go into the plot summary, courtesy of Yield IMDb, I just want to apologize for the sound quality in the Warriors of the Wasteland video. Uh, I'm aware that for some reason I don't understand, and hope doesn't repeat itself, whole syllables of what I was saying were just completely dropped. It would just randomly skip. I don't know if it was the mic or the program or what, but honestly, I was in such a, such a rush to get that episode out because the subject matter of that one scene left me so uncomfortable that I allowed it to affect the quality of my product. Now, granted, I don't... I know I don't produce the best YouTube content out there quality-wise. The sound can be inconsistent from episode to episode and whatnot, but I do still try, and that time I didn't particularly try. And, you know, the handful of you who actually watch all of these deserve better, and so I'm sorry for that. That out of the way, the plot summary for Alien Contamination also known as Contamination, depending on where you look it up, courtesy of Ye Old IMDb. A former astronaut helps a government agent and a police detective track the source of mysterious alien pod spores filled with lethal flesh-dissolving acid to a South American coffee plantation controlled by alien pod clones. As for the movie itself, it is a momentous occasion for this show, a day I had hoped would come... A day that every YouTuber who looks at cheesy movies tries to get out of the way early, but I couldn't because of the format. Because I don't choose the movies that are on these sets. Mill Creek does. But anyway. It's a canon film. I'm just so happy, you guys. Well, okay, it's distributed by Canon, but I'm still counting it. The, the Canon Films Archive is kind of like the Library of Alexandria for So Bad It's Good Movies. And it's all the more perfect, because one of the last movies I happened to see in 2017 was Electric Boogaloo, the documentary about Canon Films. Saw it on Netflix. If it's still up for streaming, you should watch it. Oh, and on top of that, it's another Italian knockoff. Two in a row. You spoil me, Mill Creek. This one is directed by Luigi Cosi, which is not actually one of the names I recognize. Again, you know, not a Bruno Mattai or Lucio Fulci film, but, you know. Uh, oh, uh, directed under the pseudonym of Lewis Coates. But, yeah, like I mentioned, this is the third movie in a row to be listed on various websites under an alternate title. Yeah, uh, well, let's hope that knocks off pretty soon. But never mind all that. The movie opens on the sound of people talking over a radio as a helicopter flies over Manhattan. This is the only sound we get as the credits roll, 
in a font color that may have been fine at the time, but sadly whatever print was used for this DVD was so degraded it blends into the background now. The plot doesn't take too long to kick off, as we learn from WXPO, all exposition all the time, that a cargo ship is coming in way too fast, and the captain isn't responding to calls. A lot of this we have to take for granted, because apparently Mr. Cozy thinks show don't tell is just a suggestion, and we get pretty much everything over the radio, while some guy on the ground is talking to another guy in the helicopter. So after telling the guy on the ground to hurry up and get the boat into quarantine, when they don't see a single living soul aboard, but all the lifeboats are in place during the day, we jump to nighttime, and a doctor from the health department arrives and is told, thank you for coming in so quickly. From bright daylight to pitch black night is quick. There was a doctor driving in from Ohio. Anyway, dialogue happens, and the doctor and a team board the ship wearing proper protective gear, or at least the best that probably would have been available to people in the late 70s and early 80s. So we're already at point one on the better than Prometheus meter. Okay, okay, I st I'll stop, I'll stop. I know everybody and their brother mocks Prometheus on YouTube, low-hanging fruit, I know. The team does find the captain's body in a closet, and the doctor tells us it looks like he exploded from the inside. Too bad it looks like they didn't have the budget to show us that. Not that it would have looked anywhere near as good as it did in Alien, but, I mean, if you're going to rip off Alien, go all in, you know? A few more bodies are found in an even worse state, and here we have our first palm meets face moment, when it is automatically assumed a virus is involved. Now, I appreciate that being presumably rational characters, they wouldn't automatically jump to aliens. I mean, the audience knows it's aliens, but stick with me here. If you're going to have your characters make a logical but wrong conclusion, have it actually be logical. Given the state of the bodies, in their shoes, I might be inclined to think some kind of wild animal or maybe even a crew member going nuts and have them call for armed backup just to be safe. I mean, again, props to the movie for acknowledging that you don't need to be stupid to be wrong. But, eh... Anywho, they get down to the cargo bay and initially find boxes of coffee from a brand none of them recognize called Universe, but with a stylized X at the end that confuses some of the team, but one of them, eh, they all kind of sound alike to me, or I guess I should say their dub actors all sound alike to me, uh, plus most of their faces are covered, so that doesn't help, but he says that it's probably just the trademark and that, that right there, that is how you do logical but wrong. Again, we the audience, we're pretty sure, although we don't know yet why, but we're pretty sure that the stylized X means something. But that doesn't mean the characters would know that it means something, at least not right then. So, point to you, movie. Point to you. Because in reality, who would stop to wonder about a weird font on a box of coffee in the middle of what could possibly be a pandemic? Or an animal attack? Whatever. That's the last I'm going to bring that point up. Now, once they see an overturned box of the coffee that has about a half dozen giant avocado-looking things that are definitely not coffee, then you can start asking questions. Sadly, this is the point in the movie where the forgivable stupid ends and the too stupid to live begins, as the team finds an alien egg, and that's not a spoiler, come on, son, and decides against advice to just pick up the one that is larger than the others and is pulsating. Naturally, the egg explodes into goo, and soon the two people the goo got on explode themselves. Like, within seconds. Yikes. No actual alien seems to come out of the egg, though, so perhaps the gestation cycle was interrupted when they moved it? I, I, I don't know. Probably too early to be guessing at the not-xenomorphs life cycle anyway, and that's assuming the film's writers put any thought into it, which may be expecting too much. The one survivor we see leaving the ship, a police lieutenant, goes into decon and we jump to a government building that, funnily enough, looks like a spaceship on the inside. Hex-shaped doors, blinking lights on the walls. This is where I would put the Airplane 2 clip if I felt like it. Apparently, Italians in the late 70s got their idea of what federal buildings looked like on the inside from Battlestar Galactica. The lieutenant tells a woman, a colonel, who I shall from here on out call the Colonel, because I'm clever, who was put in charge of the case off-screen. Uh, he tells her everything that we, the audience, already know, 
And she tells her right-hand man to get the eggs into deep freeze, saying that will neutralize whatever it is in them that makes people explode, even though she doesn't actually know what the catalyzing agent is. So how would she know that freezing them works? Did she cheat and read the script? Of course, it does work. And they get the egg that I guess is not technically an egg. I, I don't know. The, the scientist who explains it to the colonel, and the lieutenant who is still there for some reason, despite the NYPD not being in charge anymore, uh, it sounds like she was just spewing jargon, so that doesn't help. I'm not enough of an expert in, mm, well, anything, to know if there was any sort of scientific validity to what she was saying or not. I mean, obviously all the alien stuff is pure fiction, Duh, but still, I mean, just... Ugh. I mean, granted, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm totally open to that. But a lot of the stuff the scientist lady was saying about the egg just kind of sounded like techno babble to me. Oh, um, by the way, folks who may want to check this movie out after watching my show? Yeah, trigger warning for animal abuse. That poor rat. I, I will not tell you what was done to it, because I don't want to. But, see, this being an Italian production and all, I'm about 75% sure they actually used a real rat for that part. Well, after that, we actually get a somewhat funny scene of the colonel just guessing shit and being completely right. Movie, you aren't even a third of the way through yet. Slow down. We're going to run out of plot before you hit the credits at this rate. The colonel and the lieutenant, who have names, but I didn't bother to remember them, determined that the alien eggs were going to a warehouse in the Bronx. That part was learned logically with detective work. And that the eggs were going to be put in the sewers. That part was pulled directly from the colonel's ass. Oh, and get this. Not only is this movie an alien knockoff, it's an invasion of the Body Snatchers knockoff, too. We learn this, or we start to anyway, when three weird acting guys at the warehouse, after our protagonists burst in, rather creatively commit suicide by intentionally breaking open one of the eggs and spilling the make your body explode goo on themselves. That is commitment to sparkle motion, I'll give them that. Back at the lab, we get that old sci-fi staple, silicon-based life forms. Yep, the lab has confirmed what the audience already knew. These be aliens, yo. And then... With very little setup, or indication this movie was taking place in some kind of alternate timeline, as opposed to ostensibly the real world like a lot of these movies do, the colonel starts referring to an old English astronaut expedition to Mars. And apparently one of the astronauts involved came back acting crazy. I guess the goofiest shit doors and the rotating TARDIS console-looking workstation should have been a hint. Still, so much of the plot is moved forward by the colonel just randomly guessing correctly that I can only assume this script was written by a seven-year-old writing what they think deductive reasoning looks like. But at least the movie is already more than a third of the way through, so I guess points for not dragging. Still, this movie's main female hero is pulling so much out of her ass her farts no longer make noise. Speaking of her, the colonel decides that, as a member of the committee that determined the British astronaut was crazy, it's on her to bring said ex-British astronaut, who is living in New York because of the reason, in on the issue with the eggs, since they match the description of what he claimed he'd seen on Mars, but his partner on the mission had claimed he dreamed up. Safe bet that partner will turn up again before the end of the movie as a bad guy. Drama happens, and he tells his story again, but we learn his partner was allegedly killed in a private plane crash off the coast of Florida, but somehow this was not a major news story, and the colonel has to tell another military official about it. To quote Spoonie, there's willing suspension of disbelief, and then there's insulting my fucking intelligence. Am I supposed to buy that one of the only two human beings to land on Mars dies less than two years later, and that wasn't a major news story? I know CNN didn't exist yet when this movie was made, or, no, wait, did it? Shit, I don't remember. 1980? Uh, if it was released in 81, it might have been filmed in 80, but if it was released in 80, it might have been filmed in 70. No, forget it. Let me put it to you this way. Imagine for a second that Buzz Aldrin had died in a plane crash in 1971. 
I imagine if you were alive then, you'd either remember the news, or if you're young enough, you'd remember your parents talking about it. That, that kind of seems like one of those I-remember-where-I-was-when-I-heard kind of things. But the movie doesn't seem to think so. Oh, well, and now our heroes are on our way to South America, and the lieutenant is coming along because... Because they've already put this much effort into telegraphing that him and the colonel are going to have sex, and they can't do it while he's in a different hemisphere. Oh, and the British astronaut is coming along, too, despite still clearly suffering serious trauma from what he went through on Mars, which the colonel goads him into. Our hero, everybody. For fuck's sake, the Baywatch TV series treated PTSD more respectfully than this. But yes, South America... Not an ass pull for the movie, since the start of the movie established that that's where the cargo ship originated from, so, you know, that's actual logical progression there. So, you know, points to the movie for that. And, uh, well, that happened quicker than I expected. I was right, that the other astronaut had not died in a plane crash. More than halfway through the movie, we finally have our main bad guy. The guy's name is Hamilton. I hope you all appreciate the effort I am putting into avoiding making any musical jokes. A henchwoman shows him a picture of the colonel, the lieutenant, who he pegs as a cop from a single photo, because the plot says so, and his former partner from the Mars expedition. So, to recap, the fate of the world now rests in the hands of a woman whose only skill seems to be lucky guesses, a douchey cop, and a retired astronaut with PTSD. I have a feeling this team's odds of success would actually improve if they had Shinji Akari with them. Yada yada yada, casual misogyny, yada yada, unseen person plants egg in the bathroom of the colonel is taking a shower and locks her in, yada yada. And I just have to mention, the scene with the shower takes way too long. Not to mention, the colonel suddenly lost her unrealistically quick wit and tries to pick the lock to get out of the bathroom, next to the egg, which makes whale-like noises when it's about to blow up, instead of getting in the shower behind the curtain, which could at least provide some protection from the goo. Granted, she'd have better odds with a shower door than a curtain, but the goo kills on contact with skin, and her bathrobe ain't gonna cut it. Especially not when she's kneeling less than a foot away from it. You know, to be fair, this scene might have actually been kinda tense, but it drags on so long that the tension just sort of evaporates away after a couple of minutes. Ultimately, the only reason she survives is that this egg takes longer than literally every other pulsating egg in the movie to burst, and the astronaut having a gut feeling that he should knock on her door. Though apparently, the the noise the egg makes is actually only for the audience, because it is louder than the colonel's cries for help, but when the camera is on the other side of the door from her, with the astronaut, we hear her, but not the egg. I, I feel like the movie should have established that sooner. Anyway, back to the yada yada We learn Hamilton has a psychic connection to the eggs, and apparently feels pain whenever one explodes, which seems like a drawback to his plan, if you ask me, considering how many hundreds of eggs we just see on screen. After this, the colonel and lieutenant meet the henchwoman at the uh, coffee plant, though they don't know she is the henchwoman yet. Yada yada. Look, if it seems like I don't care, you're only half right. This movie is mostly pretty boring, but also, I feel like maybe I've spent a little too much time in past episodes detailing the plot. I I feel like I need to strike a little more of a balance. But while I'm figuring that out, some short-lived excitement happens when the astronaut's plane that he was using to do recon over the coffee factory, where the eggs came from, starts to sputter. I say short-lived, though, because he was already low enough when the problem started that he was able to pull off an emergency landing with only slightly more difficulty than a normal landing. You could cut the dramatic tension with safety scissors. At this point, the idiot ball starts being tossed around like a hacky sack. I mean, every movie bad guy cliche is in full effect right here, down to having the good guys surrounded by men with guns and not shooting them. Nope, Hamilton ties them up, after he said they wouldn't live to stop him. (sighs) But shooting them just makes too much sense, I guess. And, of course, romantic music plays while the colonel and lieutenant are tied up, because why spend time developing a relationship 
and you can have the astronaut narrate to the audience everything we can see him doing, down to him packing Chekhov's flare gun. Music reviewer Todd in the Shadows once said that how he decides what songs to put on his year-end worst lists is based not on which songs had the most bad, but had the least good. I never entirely understood it until now, but I think I do, because for all the griping I did about Warriors of the Wasteland, at least I wasn't bored. Anyway, this all leads to Hamilton taking the hostages that he said he was going to kill to see the Cyclops. Who is the Cyclops, you ask? Well, there was a reference to an alien Cyclops in the credits, but I'd actually forgotten about it until just now. Whoops. But yeah, as you probably guessed by now, the alien Cyclops, which looks ridiculous, by the way. Although I suppose that was probably the best they could do with the budget they had, but still. Uh, the, the Cyclops and Hamilton, for reasons based on a casual surface-level reading of Darwinian evolution, are plotting to use the eggs to... conquer the world. I am a banana! That was for you, Derek. Anyway, the astronaut, while all this has been going on, has snuck into the enemy base. The way he does so is so cliché that honestly you could just pick your favorite hero infiltrates the hideout trope, and you'd have about a 50% chance of getting it right. If you absolutely must know, hit me up on Twitter, at Arkel. Moving on, the Cyclops tries to take over the lieutenant's mind, in much the same way it did Hamilton's, in another sequence that was longer than it needed to be, because this close to the end, that means the final act is going to be rushed as fuck. But then, to the movie's credit, it throws a curveball and has the Cyclops kill Tony. Oh, that was the cop's name, by the way. After mind-controlling him, which seems like a bit of a waste, but I'm not a Martian Cyclops with two mouths that looks like it was something a Jim Henson workshop tried and failed to burn after rejecting it for use in the Dark Crystal, I'd be sad that Tony is gone, but that just spares us an unearned sex scene, so I'll allow it. The astronaut shows up and uses the flare gun to shoot the Cyclops in the eye and jump cut to the military showing up. Okay, not sure who called them, but whatever. Hamilton has a long, drawn-out death scream that lasts long enough to cross over into funny, and then the Cyclops catches on fire. Keep in mind, this is up to two, maybe even three minutes after getting shot with the flare gun. I've heard delayed reactions, but this is ridiculous, folks. So after the colonel says she wonders if there's still something on Mars just waiting for an opportunity, we cut to a shot of the World Trade Center in New York. I'd make a Martians did 9-11 joke here, but let's face it, there are people out there crazy enough to take me seriously if I did. Then we pan down to a busy city street with people walking around, and we focus on a couple of large garbage bags sitting on a corner. An egg explodes, music starts, and movie over. No end credits, we just get a freeze frame of the exploded egg, and a brief bit of music that cuts off. Considering the whole missing scene thing from Lurkers, I'm guessing that's the work print and not an error on the DVD. I did try to play the ending one more time and got the same thing, so... Of course, if this was supposed to be either sequel bait or a downer ending, it fails on both counts. At worst, some people unfortunately got splashed and died, but the goo is only fatal if you touch it, and there's a limited range. The lieutenant earlier in the movie was barely ten feet away from the first egg we saw blow up in the movie, and he wasn't touched. And while there may have been a bunch of eggs hidden all over New York, the number of hiding places you could put one of those things and not have it be seen by someone is finite. The thing is like a giant avocado, after all, and that's before it starts pulsating. And to top it off, the Cyclops is dead. So, worst case scenario, it got to take a few people down with it after getting a flare gun shot to the eye. Certainly sucks for the people who get splashed, but the movie says straight up that Hamilton's crew hadn't loaded up the rest of their boats yet. Stranger Things similarities. Um, well, we have a character who's a cop. You know, the lieutenant in this movie. Hopper in Stranger Things. Uh, let's see, the Cyclops is kind of gooey-looking and spends much of its on-screen time in shadow, so... Demogorgon, maybe? Have you squint? Maybe something else from the Upside Down? Mm. Final verdict. Boring. Boring, boring, boring. I was so bored for so much of it, even the barely adequate gore effects elicited little more than a... Oh, that's not terrible considering the budget they probably had. 
Oh, and while we're here, what is it with the Italian directors and the random, seemingly pointless close-ups? I mentioned them in the last movie, but this one had them too. Maybe even more so. Including, uh, including close-ups on one-scene characters who never got names or even lines and that we never see again. Overall, I'm going to rate this one higher than Warriors of the Wasteland, but honestly, that's only because of the previous film's sexual assault sequence. Otherwise, for all of Warriors' other problems, at least I didn't feel like I was about to fall asleep during the climax.